Hey everybody, welcome back to the PyTorch 2.0 as the engineer series. Welcome back if you've been following along. Welcome if this is the first episode. Uh, this is the series where you can ask uh, questions to our excellent engineers here on some of the new capabilities in PyTorch 2.0. And uh, this is an ongoing series. We have had several of these. Uh, you can find uh, all of these in the PyTorch 2.0, uh, PyTorch.org. Uh, events uh, events page. Oh, there you go. I can't type today. Um, there you go. Uh, PyTorch uh, events page. You'll find uh, all the upcoming ones and also the past ones. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you know where you can find the previous recordings. They're all on YouTube. Feel free to go check those out. And uh, uh, let's start with a quick uh, round of introductions and uh, we will get dive deep into the topic. So I am Shashank, I'm a developer advocate at Meta, and uh, who wants to go first? Sure, I, I'll go. Uh... <laughs> Both. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead. So hi, I'm Edward. Uh, I've been working on the PyTorch project for uh, five years now. Um, you may also know me because I also do the PyTorch Dev podcast, although I haven't done an episode recently, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be starting it up again soon. And um, I also have a YouTube channel where we, um, have posted other stuff so um you know happy to answer questions with uh, anyone who's got them that's awesome go ahead uh you're muted i think stream <laughs> stream <bloopers. laughs> uh, the joys of live stream um no. <laughs> uh uh, if you're if you're listening to us, uh, t tap something in the comments. Uh, I love. Yeah, comments. yeah. So, yeah, let us know uh, if you have questions that you want to start asking right away. Uh, we'll we'll start uh, we'll start the show with questions. Uh, we love questions, and that's the whole point of the series. A quick reminder to keep asking questions. This is not a broad. It's not a webinar. This is supposed to be a live Q and A. So we will interrupt our presentation to answer your questions. So please feel up. Other questions. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, um, loud and clear. I'm Elias. I've been an engineer on uh, PyTorch for a while and uh, been working on PT2 um, for you know as uh, in the last year or so. That's awesome. Uh, welcome, Elias. Welcome, Edward. We have, we even have a uh, um, uh, PyTorch celebrity, if you will, right, <laughs> with with Edward here. So. Um, Today, we are talking about uh, dynamic shapes, right? And uh, when I think of dynamic shapes, I think of, you know, variable length sequences or variable sized images or even batch sizes, I suppose. Is that the right um, topic we're discussing? And we already support this in PyTorch. Uh, what's new? What do, we, what do we have in PyTorch 2 that's going to be different? Um, so whoever wants to take that first and let's kick off the discussion there, I guess. That's right. So Shashank uh, mentioned, by the way, thanks everyone for commenting. Aki, Sandeep, Charles, Sai, and Vincent. Great to have you on the stream. Hope you can ask some questions. Uh, Sandeep has a general question about PD2. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so we're, we're here to talk about dynamic shapes. As Shashank said, dynamic shapes are all about like, you know, things that vary over time, right? Like if you have uh, a bunch of things you want to do training on, but like sometimes you've got 10 things in your batch, sometimes you've got five, or, you know, you're doing training over sentences and, you know, sometimes sentences are long, sometimes they are short. That's, you know, exactly what's going on uh, when we're talking about dynamic shapes. So if you're all about eager PyTorch, there's really nothing more to say. Like PyTorch works if you change the sizes. It's because we, you know, put in a bunch of kernels that uh, work, uh, you know, no matter what kind of size input you give to them. And that's that's it. That's the end of the story. But with PyTorch 2, we have a compiler. And when you have a compiler, it's not so easy to figure that out because, you know, we want to do specialization. We want to, like, give you the fastest code that, you know, can possibly run for any given operation you want to do. But... Uh, you know, sometimes you're like, well, but I don't want to only be able to handle sentences that have 100 characters in them. So you have to do something different in that case. Um, Elias, anything you want to add here? Um, nope, that sounds good. Thanks. So you mentioned, Edward, you mentioned performance and PyTorch 2. And I, I see a question that's about what's interesting in PyTorch 2. 
So the way I see it, the broad overarching theme there is performance with PyTorch 2, right? With Torch uh, Inductor yeah, and Dynamo. Right. And there's an in-depth get started guide, which I'm going to share right now in the live stream for those interested in checking out what's new in PyTorch 2. And today's topic is related to that. It's one such topic. And we've been doing live streams on all the individual topics. So uh, the two links I shared with you, the blog post and the events uh, is, is your go-to resource right now. One thing that I want awesome. to add is that PyTorch 2 isn't just like we're going to do 2.0 and that's it, right? PyTorch 2 is the beginning of PyTorch on compilers, right? So we've got Dynamo, which is the new thing that lets you actually, you know, compile your code. This time we've got it right because sometimes you're like, well, didn't you do that with TorScript? And the answer is, well, yeah, but TorScript didn't work so well. But, uh, you know, this time I, I really think we've got something good. And so there's going to be lots and lots of things that are going to get better over the future now that you have this new fundamental capability. And dynamic shapes is one of those things because... Uh, well, as you will, well, I'm happy to answer questions about it, but you know, some stuff works, some stuff doesn't work and we're working hard to make it better and better as things go along. So when I think of, uh, uh, Edward dynamic shapes, I almost think like a compiler is sort of incompatible with variable shape things. Am I thinking about it? <laughs> is, I mean, is it it's kind of like counterintuitive or it's intuitive and I just don't get it. In principle, uh, by the way, Sandeep, yes, the, these will all be uh, recorded and you can mm -hmm. view them on the series. Uh, Shashank, where, where yeah, is it? I'll share those things with you right now. Uh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, all the previous recordings are on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, head over to YouTube after the stream um, and you'll find the previous recordings there and I'll share the link. So to answer the question about like, is are all other compilers static? The answer is kind of yes. Um, I mean, in principle, it should be possible to write a compiler that can handle dynamic shapes. And like, if you think about like a C compiler or a C plus plus compiler, right? Like, obviously, you know, they they can handle all this kind of thing, not a problem. But in deep learning, you know, there's a very very heavy bias towards uh, you know having compilers that only work with static shapes. So we also think that you know. PyTorch 2's support for dynamic shapes is kind of new and interesting. It's not something that, I mean, there's plenty of work going on in other projects to like bring dynamic shapes, but you know, we we like have this as one of the really important things we wanted to uh, have in the 2.0 release because you know PyTorch's history as an eager mode framework means lots and lots of people you know love to actually write code that's very dynamic, and that's you know that's the thing. We have a lull in the questions. So Elias mm -hmm. has prepared some stuff for us to sort of uh, get the juices flowing. But as I as we said, this is not a webinar. We're just here to answer questions. But Elias, mm -hmm. you wanna you wanna show us what you got? Um, sure. Um, so uh, Shashank, do you wanna share my um, screen? I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. I've shared this yeah. uh, collab. Um, on uh, fake tensors and, and torch dispatch, which are some of the uh, mechanisms behind our, our, our uh, dynamic shape support. Um, and they're also kind of useful, um, you know, in their own right. So we're going to walk through it and, uh, you know, ask questions as they, as they come. Um, so first thing, just make sure you have your build right. Um, this is available on the nightly, but, um, you know, you have to make sure uh, you're recent enough. So um, anyways, Torch Dispatch, we're going to talk about fake tensors, um, quickly calculating shape mismatches in your code um, without any side effects. And then uh, finally, you know, training with the maximum batch size. Um, Elias, and, uh, so uh, this is just don't mind me interrupting quickly. This is a question we get every live stream. So I just want to mention. So everything with uh, uh, in this live stream that we're showing are are in the nightlies, they're, they're preview, they're in the nightlies. So if you want to get them, I think we'll share this notebook with you. It's on the top. So you have to go get the nightly Docker container or pip install from the nightlies for you to try these out. They're not available on the One X, right? So, I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> so I'll share the link to uh, this document. I know there's a question here on, uh, can you find access to the code? And I'm going to share this notebook right now. Sorry, go ahead. Um, thanks. 
Um, so what is Torch Dispatch? Uh, so Torch Dispatch is a way for you to um, overload PyTorch code with your own custom imp implementation, um, kind of in the same way that you can run model code with Float32 or Float16. Um, you can now extend it with custom data types or, or semantics, um, interpret things lazily, or really however you uh, see fit. Um, there's a, a more detailed explainer um, that I've linked in the collab uh, horses explainer here. So if you you know want all the nitty gritty, I'd recommend reading that. Um, at a high level, you know there are tensor subclasses and there are uh, torch dispatch modes. Um, so we're gonna walk through some examples and, and, and look at them. So this is just a, a very simple function. We're doing a map mole and then we're um, adding it with a, a random value, a random tensor. Um, so the first example of um, overriding this with custom functionality is through a subclass. Um, so we have this logging tensor, which all it's gonna do is print out the um, kernel that we're running as we're running it. Um, and there's a little bit of boilerplate in the new and um, this uh, torch dispatch method is actually where we override the functionality. And um, the function here is the kernel that we're going to run. And then this right here, return function args quarks is uh, where we're actually running um, the function. Uh, no dispatch is, is um, disabling um, the torch dispatch so we don't like infinitely recur. Um, so here we're, we're creating a logging tensor from a tensor and then um, we're running it and kind of as expected, we as we're running it, we print out the function. So you see that we're running a map mole and a add. Um, and then there's another way of doing the same functionality, which is as a uh, tensor mode. Um, and this is kind of similar, um, except there's one global mode as opposed to individual tensors um, being a subclass themselves. So here, a little less boilerplate, we're um, printing the function. You know, we have the kernel here and the args and, and um, arguments to the kernel. Um, so the difference here is uh, rand is captured in this um, trace because um, modes also interpose on um, constructors where, you know, otherwise um, torch.rand um, would be uh, constructed in um, this torch I ran wouldn't be a logging tensor unless there's a uh, global mode installed. So, um, and it also captures the backwards. So as you can see, we also have these um, kernels that are run as part of the backwards. So the sum and then the other map moles. Um, so that's a, a little intro into uh, torch dispatch. Again, read the, the longer post. Um, if you're interested in more details. Um, but so uh, that gets us to fake tensors. So uh, fake tensors um, are kind of tensors that don't actually have any data attached to them, but they have all of the same properties that they would if they did have data. So, you know, the shape, the strides, the uh, device, those are all captured um, in the fake tensor. So they kind of they allow you to run your code and, and reason about the shapes your program would have had or, or other properties um, without actually running the kernels or you know requiring the um, particular uh, devices or accelerators. Um, so if you're familiar with meta meta tensors, which uh, Ed worked on, um, it's sort of a similar thing. Um, only fake tensors also. Um, record the device um, that you ran your model. So you know which parts of your model were in CPU and which one parts were in uh, CUDA or other um, devices. Um, and we use them a lot throughout 2.0 to trace through PyTorch um, and uh, to kind of reason about your program and do optimizations. Um, so one use case is, you know, you, we kind of have this long running issue to statically checks type shapes. And, you know, that's very difficult because Python's very hard to statically type anyways. And then tensor programs are also, um, can be very dynamic as, as Ed was referring to earlier. 
and uh, hard to type in their own right. So, you know, maybe who knows when we'll eventually get to the statically checked shapes. Um, we're certainly not there yet, but um, one thing you can do is, is run um, with fake tensors to like, you know, check if you have any shape mismatches without doing, uh, you know, slope kernels or, or like actually touching your, your data. Um, so here we run, we install the fake tensor mode, which is a torque dispatch, dispatch mode. Um, and then we run this uh, model and, and take the backward. Um, and uh, no, it's not actually faster than running kernels yet, but um, you know that's one thing we're tracking and hopefully uh, soon we'll optimize it to, to run a little more quickly. Um, so that the fake tensor is a is an is a new capability, right? It's that's new with two point oh features too, right? Or is it something that we've had in the past? Um, so fake tensors were uh, part of um, a like torch disk X, like kind of an experimental sublibrary, mm -hmm. okay. um, and now they've like been re-implemented in core and um, are kind of more tightly integrated with the PT2 stack and are in Python and a little bit more um, hackable. Um, so some of you may be familiar with its previous iteration, but it's like more widely available um, now. Mm -hmm. so, thanks. Awesome. Um, so here, you know, we, we're running our model um, with fake tensors um, and we get this error message that says we need to have, you know, channel three channels instead of one. Um, we rerun it with the right input size and we don't get an error. So, um, you know, that's one use case is just um, checking if you have any like logic errors in your program. Um, so uh, another thing we can do is um, computing um, the maximum batch size. Um, so uh, to do that, we're going to have to keep track of all of the uh, live fake tensors um, in our program and like the, the storage sizes um, that they you know would take if they were real. Um, and to do this, we can use another torch dispatch mode. Um, you know, they're composable um, to compute maximum live memory. Um, and just one thing, one kind of disclaimer is that sometimes in practice, uh, the maximum batch size may actually be less than what we're calculating here um, because of you know memory fragmentation in the allocator or um, other sort of um, uses of memory. But this is like the ideal um, you know, uh, memory use that we're going to calculate. A quick question, um, if you don't mind, uh, Elias. Um, more, I guess, fundamental naive question is why? Why would we want to calculate the maximum batch price? It's mostly performance related, right? How much can you shove into a device? Um, yeah. Is that the main motivation for why we would want to go through this exercise? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of it's performance related. Yeah, you like want to shove as much training. Um, data in one run as you can um, without, you know, running out of memory. Um, to give a little mm -hmm. more color on this, like the mm -hmm. reason why you want more data is twofold. So one is that <clears throat> there's fixed overhead to like launching kernels on mm. CUDA. So if you like put a teeny tiny amount of data, then you're going to mostly be overhead bound. And well, PyTorch 2 is here to like help you be less overhead bound by fusing kernels together. But like in general, like the more data you shove through, the less and less framework overhead matters. So batch, large batch size helps there. But there's another reason as well, which is that like it's actually different to train a model on a large batch size than a small batch size, because some operations will actually normalize over all the elements in the batch. So the bigger your batch is, the you know more like examples you can sort of average over when you're doing one of these reductions. And in many cases, that also helps convergence time. Uh, okay. We got some questions in the chat. Yeah. Can I ask you a quick um, question so, the, related to what you said? And then we'll start picking some of those questions. Uh, you said it's different. Did you mean they're mathematically different? Mathematically oh, different. So like if you okay. train them all with batch size 8 or 16, like you'll get different results in the end, even if okay. everything okay. is so It may or may not be desirable, but it's definitely desirable from a performance standpoint. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's do questions. Uh, yeah, Elias, thanks. you want to answer the fake tensor one? Yeah. That's so uh, you could do oh, these yeah. things without fake tensors. What is the benefit of using fake tensors? Um, so I guess a, a, a few things. Um, one is like it can be kind of annoying just in CUDA when you run it and um, you get the OOM, you have to reset everything. And it's like just a little bit of an annoying process, not that big of a deal. Um, but another thing is um, by, by using fake tensors, you can like more easily say, oh, like how does my memory use scale as my batch size uh, increases even beyond the like capabilities of your device or um, put some of your fake, put some of your network on CPU um, like you do checkpointing or, or like checkpoint activations to, to CPU and um, kind of just reason without the constraints that your actual device has. Um, so kind of a, um, yeah, the dreaded um, <laughs> um kind of um, one, one use case that uh, Torch Dis X um, uses fake tensors for is uh, deferred initialization, which is where you have some huge model and you kind of want to shard it over many um, different uh, servers or devices. And um, you know, kind of initializing with fake tensor tensors gives you a way to reason about uh, where that sharding should be without you know, blowing up your one server that can't um, hold the big model. Um, so it's a way of reasoning about your program without kind of the constraints of the device. Um, you definitely could do a lot of this stuff with actual real tensors as well. Um, In fact, before we had fake tensors, we did all of PyTorch 2's compilation with real tensors. And it mostly worked, except, you know, when the compiler would oom while it was compiling because it was <laughs> trying to, like, shove the entire model <laughs> and, and, and actually execute it. The fake tensor helped yeah. a lot with that. I really want to answer Jadeep's question because it's a really interesting yeah. question. So Jadeep's question is, for dynamic shape in Torch RNN, pack padded sequence and pad pack sequence are very useful, but it has issues with Onyx export. Is there a good way to handle such cases? So unfortunately, I don't have a direct answer for how to help you with your Onyx export because um, uh, I haven't like done very much stuff with Onyx for years. But um, pack padded sequence and pad pack sequence are very interesting functions because um, they are what we call data dependent operations. So um, to explain what a data dependent operation is, um, let's think about a simpler operation. So torch.nonzero, what does this function do? So torch.nonzero says, give me a tensor and then give me a new tensor, which only has the non-zero elements. In it. So you know, however many non-zero elements in it, that's what you're gonna get. So how big is the output tensor you get in this situation? Well, you might think, well, you don't know, right? Because if there's 20 you know, non-zero elements, you'll get a size 20 tensor. If there are five, then you'll get a size five one. So that's what I mean by the output shape is uh, data dependent. And so this traditionally causes a lot of problems for you know, all those systems that are like, oh, everything is static and there are you know, no problems. Well, uh-oh, you've got this tensor in the middle of your network that might vary size over time. So what are you going to do? Well, one of the things we worked really hard on um, when adding dynamic shape support to PyTorch 2.0 was like actually being able to handle this case. So in these particular cases, um, what we do today and what we plan to do in the future are different. So what we do today is um, if you want to uh, like torch.compile one of these things, so not an Onyx export, but torch.compile, we are going to do what's called a graph break. And so this is very different, right? So if you're exporting a model, um, you know, you need it all in one piece. But part of what makes PyTorch 2 work on so many models, whereas with Torch Script, you had to just, you know, you had to like Torch Scriptify your models, it didn't really work out of the box, is whenever we see something we don't like, we're just like, okay, we're going to stop compiling, we're going to go back to error mode, and then we'll pick up compiling again after we've gotten past the operator that's being bad and terrible. So we get to non-zero, we're like, uh-oh, this is a data-dependent output op. We're in a graph break. And then we have a new graph, which takes in whatever the uh, output of non-zero was. And now here's where dynamic shape support comes in, right? If your compiler is able to compile the, uh, the suffix of your computation, the thing after non-zero um, with dynamic shapes, then you are fine, right? Because like a non-zero gives you 20, gives you 40, whatever, you've got a single kernel that works in all those cases and you don't recompile. So this is what we expect to work today. 
What we want to do in the future is we want to be able to capture this entirely in one graph without having a graph break. And now that helps you out if you're trying to export, like say to Onyx, because you can actually get a graph with a non-zero in it and you know everything is great. And to handle this, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I've been working on is this thing called unbacked symbolic integers. That's a mouthful, so let's unpack it, right? So <laughs> why are we talking about integers? It's because we're talking about the sizes of tensors, and those are integers, uh, natural numbers, really, but, you know, we just call it integers. Symbolic, because we don't know what the integers are, right? We want to represent them symbolically without reference to a real value. Like when you call non-zero, you don't know if it's a 5 or a 10. So we're going to call it S0. We're going to say, well, I don't know what it is, but it's S0. And unbacked means that I don't know what the actual value is. For a lot of things we do with shake computation in PyTorch, we know what the symbolic variables are. And so if you say, ask, hey, is this shape equal to 20? We can look at what the actual underlying thing is, and uh, that'll tell us uh, whether or not it's true or false. But for a unbacked symbolic integer, we don't know. Uh, it looks like we lost Elias. Maybe Elias will be back in a moment. We don't know what it is, and we have to actually go ahead and um, we have to uh, we have to re reason entirely symbolically. And so, if you want to do this conditional, that doesn't work. We have to give an error in this case. The rewinding back to the question, right? So, how do we actually export pack padded sequence? Well, these operators are also data dependent because what you're doing is you've got this sequence which is padded and you want to pack it into a sequence that's not padded. How long the unpadded sequence is depends on you know, how much padding you actually had in your tensor, which is a data dependent thing. And so if unbacked simmons work and dynamic shapes work, then you can actually export these programs without actually you know, needing to, uh, you know, like it just doesn't work today with Onyx export. And with dynamic shapes, it will work. Well, that's the hope. We're, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I think Edward, you you answered a lot of different questions in that <laughs> in that explanation. I, I, it's a great question. I really wanted to answer that question. Yeah, it, it covers I think so much some stuff. Of the, some of the things I took away was your your explanation around uh, the graph break thing that makes total sense. So if you had these um, uh, these ops that you you couldn't you have to have two separate subgraphs, right? Because you had some dynamic shape thing here, then you couldn't do operator fusion across it. You could do operational fusions before. You can do it after, but you could do you couldn't do it because it, that is there, right? And if you have many of those, then there are many such breaks. And as we as you discussed in the beginning, that will mean more overhead, right? I get that summary right. More overhead mm -hmm. for uh, device communications and and all that. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. That was that was a good explanation. Uh, I, I while we wait for questions, there are two that are sort of a digression to our topic. I don't know if you want to take them. Feel free to take them. This is about support for yeah, sure. 2.0 on, uh, on Apple Silicon. I, two, there are two people who asked the question, so I'll just summarize that. Is is it supported? Um, and and related is is mixed precision supported? Yeah. So we at at, at the current time and for the upcoming 2.0 release, we're not going to have a MPS backend for PyTorch 2.0. However, there's no reason yeah, we couldn't let's, have uh, one. Unravel that a little bit for the rest of MPS is metal. Oh, yes. So MPS is metal performance shader. Shader. OK. That's your equivalent to, I guess, not CUDA, but one level lower for a GPU user. So that's sort of the, um, well, CUDA is a level higher than the GPU shader. Uh, MPS so. is kind of, um, it's higher level than CUDA in my opinion. Oh, it is? OK, OK. Yeah, because but, but it, it doesn't really matter. It's just shaded. this is the thing anyway. for Apple GPUs. So if you want right, NVIDIA, right. you do CUDA. And if you want Apple, right, it's yeah. Metal or MPS. Or, mm -hmm. So that's or, a low or, level API to program a G, uh, an Apple Silicon. That's, yeah, that's okay. right. So but, uh, it, it totally makes sense to do it. It's just like sort of not currently announced so far. Okay. Elias? And uh, mixed position should work without with MPS, not on 2.0. So. It does, yeah, in yeah. your mode. And also, if you want to just CPU, do CPU wow. training on Apple Silicon with mixed mm -hmm. precision, that all works. And like, I mean, you know, the 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 Apple Silicon process <coughs> CPU processor is also pretty nifty. And we have the fine folks at, well, weirdly enough, Intel um, working on the CPU <laughs> in your backend. 
in PyTorch 2. And they're, they're, they're also hard at work um, you know, giving you good CPU performance as well. So check that out as well. That's awesome. Uh, end of the day, I think the developer experience should be torch.compile and everything is magically faster on every hardware <laughs> that you're running this on. I guess that's the holy yeah, that, grail that's user. The, that's the holy grail. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, there was also a question about um, on TPU, and there actually I have more to report. So the way you can run PyTorch on TPUs uh, today, uh, TPUs being Google's, um, you know, deep learning hardware, um, is via our PyTorch XLA integration, which uh, you know basically it, it's kind of it's kind of like uh, pre pre PT 2.0, where what they do is you run your model and you capture all the operations that happened on it using what's called lazy tensor, and then they ship that off to XLA to compile. And so they are actively looking at integrating directly with Dynamo for XLA. So yes, PyTorch 2 and XLA and TPUs, this, this, is, this, is, this is a go. This will happen in the near future. Yeah, I think we had a talk on, um, uh, feel free to check it out for folks who are joining in today. Uh, we had a talk on backend integration uh, where we where we discussed um, how new how hardware vendors like you know TPUs or, or um, GPUs and others could actually um, integrate with the PyTorch 2.0 graph compilation system, right? The Torch Dynamo and Torch um, Inductor and all that. So there's a set of low level APIs they can use to integrate, which is different from the previous path, which was uh, XLA. Uh, which brings me to a question that I have, and I don't, I don't know if it makes sense in this context, but would the the symbolic support that you're doing with dynamic shapes, how will it percolate down to the, I guess, torch prim and further down the stack for hardware? Would they have to each address it differently? I, I don't know if that, that makes sense. <laughs> how would that flow through the existing compiler system in 2.0? Did oh, my I question see. make sense? Oh, I see. <laughs> um, this one. Yeah. Um, so I guess like with prims or with dynamic shapes, like it's it's going to be infrastructure that's like available for them. So in, in the prims, you know, kind of limiting the operators they'll have to um, implement for PyTorch, which makes it easier uh -huh. to add a backend. Um, and for dynamic shapes, it should help them, you know, like consume like... Uh, <clears throat> what is how is this you know size calculated from the inputs etc so um hopefully you know the kind of information that we capture at the higher level will be used by backends in, in kind of the same way that we've used it for our own backend um as things flow down the stack awesome uh andy rock has a question time. yeah yeah is symbolic rank a planned feature for dynamic shapes, i.e. Ufunk style arbitrary leading batch mm -hmm. dimensions? So uh, just to um, help uh, the others out on the stream, so what Andy means when he talks about Ufunk is this concept in NumPy called uh, Ufunk, short for universal functions. And it's a very fancy way of saying basically things that are like add, mull, or uh, div, or sub, the things that, you know, uh, they're point-wise operations, and you can add as many dimensions as you want, and they sort of generalize in the normal way. Um, so in this particular case, um, a symbolic rank might refer to like, hey, I've got a tensor, and maybe I want to have one batch dimension, or two batch, or three, you know, as many as you want. Uh, you know, why not? Uh, whatever. And so unfortunately, the answer to the question is no. No symbolic ranks for you. If you really need this to work, what you should do is you should reshape your tensor to squash all the batch dimensions into a single dimension and then pass that to you know, your torch compiled thing. The reason why we're not doing symbolic ranks is one, it's complicated because uh, you no longer get to do reasoning only on symbolic integers. Remember I was talking about symbolic integers, right? Like this is sort of the lifeblood of dynamic shapes. We just treat, we have a bunch of integers and we do computation on them and we treat it symbolically and that's how we actually compile it. If you have symbolic rank, it's not just symbolic integers. You have a like symbolic list which might vary in size. And Elias has some experience with this because uh, he spent some time working with Z3 formulas for uh, you know, doing shape computation. 
Yeah, it, uh, it, it makes everything a lot more complicated. And like for our particular implementation and the new, um, uh, new dynamic shapes, like it means you can't like just kind of trace through operations and record them. Like you now have higher order operators that you'll need to contain like looping through dynamic lists, things like that. Um, but as, as uh, Edward mentioned, um, like using reshape or using a, a torch dispatch subclass potentially to uh, kind of contain your, your higher level multi um, uh, unbounded batch dimensions um, tensor and, and actually implement it with, with fixed dimension. Um, a10 operators might be a, a way forward, which, um, you know, relates to the, the collab I'm, I'm sharing. We um, don't think there are too many use cases where, you know, you really legitimately need uh, symbolic ranks. Um, the one that I can think of that isn't, uh, well, okay, so there's two I can think of. So one is... Um, uh, Pyro, the probabilistic and some other probabilistic programming frameworks, they often like allocate a dimension per variable that is being reasoned about. So you get these like wacky like 128 dim tensors, and like that's going to work very poorly with Torch dot compile because we don't have symbolic dims. Sorry, so that that won't work well. And the other thing I can think of is if you're just trying to like compile a kernel that like yeah is general purpose and doesn't recompile. Um, you know, like a ufunk, right? You want to write your own ufunk and then compile it with Torch Compile and then call it in a normal PyTorch Eager program. And the answer to that is no, we just can't do that. You'll just end up with a specialization per dim. There's a non-dynamic shapes related question, but since we don't have any other questions, um, we should do it. Uh... Yeah, there um... is a new question and uh, I'll just read it out. So... Uh, we have people joining in from different platforms, so I'll just read out the question so everyone knows. So this question is about, as PyTorch 2.0 became more complex, it became harder for newcomers who want to dive into low-level components to understand it. What would you suggest as a resource for better understanding? Uh, I have thoughts, but do, do, do any of you want to take that? We can, we can each give our takes, but... Um, I think uh, it's true. It's it's more complex. There's a lot of different components. Um, I would uh, like hopefully these developer series, other kind of posts that we've been making, will be a good enough introduction to any one of those components. Whether it's like uh, you know dynamic shapes, as Edward is mentioning, or like our autograd handling or, or our lower level or Python tracing or our like lower level code gen. Um, so hopefully there are good resources and tutorials there. Um, I would start there, um, you know, go to the code base, like look at recent PRs, look for um, small issues. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the best way to kind of understand something I think is, is to contribute. So looking for open issues or, or recently kind of closed smaller ones and reading code, um, I guess would be my my thoughts. But I don't know, Ed, what do you think? Well, and talking about contributions, this is one of the things where I think PyTorch 2 is actually substantially better than some of the other uh, sort of compiler, uh, you know, uh, attempts that we made. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of TorchScript. And the reason it is better is because all nearly all of PyTorch 2 stack is written in Python. Dynamo, the thing that does the bytecode, all in Python. Inductor, mm. our compiler, which compiles to Trident for getting kernels, all in Python. So, so you actually like you, you don't have to like you know be a you know like build environment rock star and have a local build of PyTorch from source to like actually get started hacking on any of this stuff. You can like literally just go and edit the Python files or like look at the back traces that Python normally gives you. Yes, they're very long back traces and you kind of need to know what you're looking for. So yes, it's more complicated because like you want to work on Dynamo, you need to know what's going on with bytecode, you know, what, what's symbolic evaluation. You want to work on inductor, you need to know a little bit about Trident, you need to know about uh, you know, how exactly are defined by your own code generation works. So yes, there are more concepts to understand. But like, if you just like like tinkering around and like changing things, adding prints, seeing what's going on, it's way, way, way more accessible. And we are going to keep this stack in Python 
like basically mm. as much as we can. Um, we're actually like dealing with some trace time performance issues where it's like slower to run fake tensor than it is to run CPU because CPU is all in C++ and optimized because eager mode required it. Fake tensor, we did it all in Python. And so it's not very optimized and it's slow, but like there's ways to optimize it, which don't involve writing C++ and like that's sort of how we're pushing on this stuff. The, uh, the only thing I want to add, add to that is you didn't mention what, um, role you're going to be playing so i, I kind of see three roles right you have the user which who ideally don't doesn't have to care about all these things right with torch.compile things to work right from a user experience point of view it's straightforward or you're sort of a back-end integrator you're you're a hardware vendor or you're building something at the low end then you have the back-end integration apis and if you're somewhere in between then i don't know what your role is other than you're a contributor uh, or a maintainer you want to contribute or maintain. And in which case, the resources, are, like the dev discuss, dev discuss is an amazing place. It is a, it's a gold mine of information and you can ask questions. And there's also the contributor Slack uh, where you can ask questions. So if you're not at the vendor integration or the user somewhere in between, you're trying to learn, I think those are the resources in addition to ones uh, Edward mentioned, just contributing is sort of one of the best ways to um, learn the intermediate part of the uh, stack. Um, yeah, there's there are two more questions. Um, I, 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 I'll ask it. Now, what about uh, Todd script and the future of Todd script, I guess, to put it, put it. To the extent we feel comfortable discussing, right? Yeah. Without, yeah. I think so, it's um, safe to say that, you know, we're, we're not, super actively making contributions there. I don't know about exact deprecation um, lifetime. So, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly for um, like training or, or, you know, whatever we recommend using torch.compile um, for some of the other use cases, um, like such as server edge. Yeah, there's no, not, a, not a firm de deadline yet on replacements. Okay, we do have fans of Totscript uh, in the in the comments. So, <laughs> uh, uh, there's another other question about when when will there be a launch of 2.0 Alpha? I, I don't know if you use those designations, but it's in the night list today. Uh, if you want to try it out, and uh, the GA would be in the future. Uh, I don't know if you're giving. We have any specific dates, but do we use the Alpha designation or? I, I, I think know, I we're like technically in alpha right now. And then when we actually <laughs> release 2.0, like torch.compile is going to be a beta feature. I don't know. Uh -huh. But like basically like, you know, intrepid users are testing it out today and sending us yeah. tons of bugs. Thank you for the bugs. Um, we're working hard at fixing them. There are a lot of bugs. And um, when the release comes around, we're hoping we'll have something useful. It will be buggy. Um, like no no doubt but it will work on a lot of models and um, incremental you know, updates yeah and we yeah. will be working hard on like fixing problems as it goes yeah uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah i guess i can call out please try it it's in the night list like um i uh, just start by running the examples that's on the blog post and then take it from there and of course please let us know um that's how we improve open source it should be buggy in, in loud ways, hopefully as well. So if it if it's buggy, you'll know. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's another question: How to remove keys from tot state dict? Default pop method doesn't work. I don't know if it's related to our topic of discussion. Unless uh, you still want to take take it. I have no idea, but I like Baz's suggestion. Use Dell. Uh, that that makes sense to me too. <laughs> <There you> <laughs> Yeah, we have a community. We're building a community. Oh, actually, yeah. oh, so maybe the problem is that, uh, uh, no, so Dell won't work either because state dict returns a shallow copy of the dictionary in question. Uh, probably what I would do is I would just uh, look at the source code, find the underlying attribute that actually has the thing, and delete that. I don't think we have a public API for this. Sorry. OK, we've got an actual dynamic shapes question, and I want to answer it. Is there a document for dynamic shapes yet? Thank you, Amir. So yes, there is. So um, 
So uh, I've been posting weekly updates on the status of Dynamic Shapes on Dev Discuss. So if you're like really interested in the most up-to-date info about what's going on, you can check that out. But I've yeah. also got... Edward, yes. I, I just quickly interrupt you just to say that this question came from LinkedIn and uh, we are posting links, but it's not going to LinkedIn. It's only going to YouTube. Uh, what we'll do is at the end of the stream, I'll post all those links on LinkedIn. But if you want it right away because you're you're uh, uh, impatient, then they're available on the YouTube stream. So sorry for the glitch, but uh, just wanted to mention I am posting links, but it's not showing up on LinkedIn. It's showing up on YouTube. Sorry. Continue, Edward. The other thing that I'll add is that um, we've also got a dynamic shapes manual, um, which I've shared on the on the dev discuss posts. And this manual is essentially um, uh, it's oriented towards people who are like working on making their code work with dynamic shapes because dynamic shape support is sort of this ongoing process where some operations in PyTorch support dynamic shapes and some don't. And the manual tells you how to like go ahead and like extend support for dynamic shapes to other operators. And this is especially important for us internally. Like internally, we use PyTorch and we have a lot of custom operators that like sort of aren't in open source because they're just like random stuff that like, you know, people play around with and like have unstable APIs and stuff like that. And they're like, hey, we want to use Torch.compile on this stuff. And we're like, okay, but you got to write a what's called meta function for the operator saying how to actually do the compute. And how do you do that? Well, you can check out the manual to find out that. Um, if you're more of an end user and you're just curious about what's going on with dynamic shapes, like how do I tell if it did anything or not? There is a case study uh, for OpenNMT, which is one of the more recent posts in the thread. That's also worth checking out. We can look at that in more detail if uh, no one asks more questions. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I guess the two main things are the manual and the blog post. The blog post, um, it's on Dev Discuss, just to clarify for everyone, which is the discussion forum. And that's a gold mine. Every time I go there, I find I learn something. So it's a gold mine of information there. Uh, don't go to the PyTouch blog. Uh, you won't find it there, but it's in Dev Discuss. Um, all right. So did we cover contribute? Uh, how how um, people can contribute? Um, or do you want to, I know you touched upon it. Do we want to spend a couple more minutes just showing the ways people can contribute to this if they want to? Um, no, I'd rather talk about like, what does inductor code look like with dynamic? <laughs> okay. Um, we don't have any more questions. Are there, are there, uh, any, I guess, uh, key takeaways? uh that we want to share or what we want people to do try it out i guess try it out in the night lease yeah so um, if you want to try it out just run torch.compile with dynamic equals true on mm. the in the torch compile call and so in the most recent night lease what you should should expect to work is inference will work and training will not work um, Horace uh, mm. has a PR that makes training work. If you're feeling very adventurous, you can go uh, check that out. But um, it hasn't it hasn't landed to master yet. We're going to land it before we actually go 2.0. And uh, we are like passing like basically every benchmark model on the benchmark suite. If you're not actually compiling stuff, that this is like kind of lame though, because like the whole point of PyTorch 2 is to compile stuff. Um, we have a few more uh, errors uh, in compilation, mostly around, uh, oh, it's so silly. Um, floor and seal don't work quite correctly if they show up in index computations at compile time. So we're hoping to fix that too before, uh, before branch cut, but we'll see how that goes. Bleed bleeding edge folks. <laughs> That's... Okay. Um, all right. So we haven't had any uh, more questions. So final call, I guess. Final call. Uh, questions. Um, uh, if we don't, then we'll start uh, wrapping up. I, I think we had a good discussion. There's a lot of good insights shared and resources too. So feel free to check those links out on the YouTube stream. I'll also share them uh, later on, on, on LinkedIn in addition to YouTube. Um, any more questions? Going once, I don't know, going, what? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> no, been an auction, but uh, going once, going twice. Okay. 
all right <laughs> so i guess let's let's wrap up so uh thanks thanks edward thanks um uh elias so we a uh, quick quick summary right we shared some resources and i'm going to share them again and there's also a youtube we, there's a video on youtube on the conference talk from hores you mentioned uh, i'll be sharing all of those again many of those links are on the stream and uh, please please check out dev discuss and raise issues please try it out i think that's the single uh, biggest call to action go try it out and uh, let us know how it goes and uh, we'll we'll close there then um see you uh, in the next stream and uh, la la last um, sorry i'm going back on my <laughs> i i just want to mention again the there are a lot more talks happening uh, on all the individual features of pytorch 2.0 they're on the pytorch.org slash events page. Uh, we've had several in the past and we are having, we have more, so you can go there and register or click the notify button on YouTube or subscribe, whichever you prefer to be, way to be notified. And I'll close there. All right. Um, see you everyone. See you in the next live stream. Thanks, Edwards. Thank you guys. See you all later. Bye.